for more, we're joined in studio by William Hartung, director of the Arms and Security Initiative at the New America Foundation, author of Prophets of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military-Industrial Complex. We're also joined by Michael Hudson, president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends, distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, author of Super Imperialism, the Economic Strategy of American Empire. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Michael Hudson, what about this vote? What does it mean? Well, it's an anti-stimulus package, primarily. Uh, the uh, feeling among uh, the Democrats that I've spoken to, uh, I've never seen them so uh, depressed. And what depresses them so much is that uh, the irony is it could probably only be passed under a Democratic administration. Eve Smith has called it uh, a Nixon goes to China mo a moment in reverse. Uh, and that's because only a Republican could have made an opening to a communist country and not be accused of communism. Uh, only a Democratic president could have uh, drawn along a Democratic Congress in supporting a law that is going to uh, essentially add tax deflation to the debt deflation we already have in the what economy. What does that mean, tax deflation uh, to tax, the debt that deflation? That means that the government is going to be sucking money out of the economy. Normally, uh, government is supposed to provide the economy with money, provide it with uh, purchasing power. By government running a deficit, this is what uh, traditionally, for 5,000 years in every country, has supplied money. Uh, and now the government uh, isn't going to do it. There's a kind of junk economic belief that governments shouldn't run a deficit. And yet it's by running a deficit that uh, an economy expands. That's what injects the purchasing power in. That's why uh, a few years ago, uh, Mr. Obama had the $700 billion stimulus package. The idea was government spending will stimulate employment and make it more uh, than it otherwise would have been, and you stop the unemployment. Right now, the economy economy is shrinking. It needs some kind of spending to overcome the shrinking. And since the government can't supply uh, the credit, that means that the economy is going to have to rely on commercial banks, and they're going to charge interest. And it means that uh, all of the growth that uh, does occur in the economy is basically going to be paid to Wall Street, not to uh, the people who produce the wealth, not to industry or its employees. The economy is going to shrink. Uh, industrial corporations will shrink. Uh, real estate will shrink. Uh, and the government isn't doing anything to prevent uh, this shrinkage uh, into a deeper and deeper uh, recession. So why did Obama go this route? What were his alternatives? He had and many what about the um, the relationship that was touted between Obama and Boehner? Uh, ultimately, people saying it was the Tea Party that uh, broke with Boehner, and so he just couldn't follow through for Obama. It wasn't the Tea Party. Suppose that uh, a Republican were president, or George Bush. If George Bush would have been president, or another Republican, McCain, and would have proposed this, you would have had the whole Democratic Congress. Congress voting against it. And you would have had a lot of progressive Republicans voting against it. Uh, they're not going to vote against a Democratic president. And in fact, uh, uh, that's why uh, it was called a Nixon goes to China in reverse. Only a Democrat could have imposed so uh, deflationary, so negative, uh, regressive uh, a policy. Uh, and that's why the Democrats uh, felt so frustrated when they were split, as you pointed out, 95 to 95. They felt that they had to support the government. The, re uh, the reason that they're uh, disappointed is there were many alternatives. All last week, while all of this uh, f fight was building up, you didn't have a squiggle in the, s in the bond market. Wall Street was not at all worried that there was going to be any problem at all. So as far as uh, the real monetary economy uh, uh, is concerned, there wasn't a problem. Uh, Obama could have invoked the 14th Amendment saying that the government is going to uh, always uh, pay the debts. It can't be questioned. He could have uh, issued a $1 trillion platinum coin, uh, worth maybe $50, uh, to the Federal Reserve and uh, retired the government debt. There were all sorts of technicalities that he could have done. He didn't do any of them. And that's because, uh, as he explained to the people last week in his, uh, his uh, speech, he really believes in running a budget uh, surplus. He believes that that's good for the economy. And uh, that's the tragedy of all this, that uh, it's not good. I want to turn to Obama. Unveiling the deal on Sunday night, he said the agreement was born out of a need to compromise. Now, 
Uh, is this the deal I would have preferred? No. I believe that we could have made the tough choices required on entitlement reform and tax reform right now, rather than through a special congressional committee process. But this compromise does make a serious down payment on the deficit reduction we need and gives each party a strong incentive to get a balanced plan done before the end of the year. Most importantly, it will allow us to avoid default and end the crisis that Washington imposed on the rest of America. In your assessment of what President Obama said and um, how this could have been averted. I mean, there was a person, a journalist at a press conference in December when he um, went along with the Bush tax cuts um, uh, for the wealthy, saying, why didn't you attach this, a guarantee of a debt ceiling, if you were going to do that at the time? And Obama said he wasn't afraid. Well, the real question is the reverse. How did these tax issues get attached to a debt ceiling issue? Since 1963, the debt ceiling ceiling's been raised every eight months on the average. It's just automatically been raised. Nobody in any of these 83 times has ever tried to attach a policy rider to the debt ceiling. It's always been uh, like a, uh, an accountant just signing off uh, on uh, everything. This is the first time that a debt ceiling has ever been linked to tax policy. That's never been done before. So there didn't have to be a compromise. Uh, Mr. Obama could have simply said, uh, tax Tax policy is tax policy. If you want to argue over that, spend a year in doing that. But a debt ceiling is but clearly uh, people something already all by saw itself. that this might be an issue because the Tea Party Republican activists were already talking about it. Yeah. I think that uh, Mr. Obama actually didn't anticipate that it would be made an issue. He was thinking like a lawyer and thinking this is how it's normally done. There's no connection. What he could have done is gone to the people and say, explained why he believed that. He could have said, look, I didn't anticipate it because this is outrageous. This has never been done, and I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to let the Republicans link. I don't have to compromise uh, because this isn't the point to compromise. Compromise is when uh, the Senate and the House uh, debate a tax law. But this isn't the time for debate. This is the time to approve what the Congress has already agreed to spend. We're going to go to break, then come back. Michael Hudson is with us, uh, author of Super Imperialism, the Economic Strategy of American Empire, distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City.